Thank you, Van. Uh, this morning, if you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18. And as you turn there, uh, continue to pray. I just see Sister Connie there. Pray for our other Leonard. How's he doing with that? Okay. So continue to pray, Leonard. You know, he's dealing with uh, got liver uh, disease, but we're relieving God for miracle there. So keep him in your prayers. Leonard, Leonard never any, man. 1 Kings, chapter 18. Praise God. Go with me to verse 30. All right. Let me get there myself. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two sails of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bowl in pieces, and laid it on the wood and said, Fill four water pots with water, pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and I, that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell on the consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and they licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Let us stop there. I don't know if you have read that story before, but it's a mighty miracle, amen, before the people of God. Before, but before I get into this, amen, you know, the other day I ran into a good friend of mine from back in the days, I went to high school with him and he, uh, he happens to work at Lowe's. And um, uh, he's a believer and he goes to another church. And I asked him, I go, how you doing, man? And how's it going in your life? And he goes, oh, good, how's church? And, you know, when, when I asked him that, all of a sudden I got the, I got the deadly pause. <laughs> like, okay, why'd you have to go there, Eddie? You know, uh, how's church? How's church going? Oh, it's going good, but I, man, I haven't went in a while, but it's good. And I go, man, you need to get back, bro. Look, 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 look what's going on in our world. And, uh, man, you, you know, you, you need to get back where you need to be. And I'm not always like, you can just encourage you to get back to, to church where you belong. Right. And uh, church is trying to encourage him. And unfortunately, there are many, if not numerous people in his condition. Yes. Okay, when it comes to the relationship with God, uh, there may be apathy, the coldness of heart, and uh, just lack of burden for the kingdom of God, whether it's involved in the church, coming to church, or personal devotion is just things have gotten cold come on and you know you know I was praying the other day and, and you know not the other day I prayed daily okay so not, not like I only pray like only other days but, yeah, I, I, but I was praying the other day a couple of days ago about certain things that but I found myself troubled in my spirit and and because I felt that my prayers were for the most part the majority of my prayers were all about believers and to be more specific, 
believers who have gotten cold in heart, careless concerning their salvation, forsaking the assembly of one another, and for believers that are in open sin without any shame. Now, I'm not standing up here. Aren't you glad you came to church? Because they, no, that's not you for the most part. Or at least you, for the assembly, you got that one right today. You're in church, okay? But, and now listen to me. I'm not standing up here just throwing stones either. But I found myself really troubled about believers for, you know, I don't know how your prayer life is, but for the, my prayer life, usually for the most part is about the unsaved, the lost, my family, and, you know, just the things we pray for. But lately I've been really praying for God's people and for the fact that they are in this condition. And I understand I was not praying in anger or in a self-righteous manner or attitude. Like, man, God, where are these believers? Where are they at? What are they doing? You know what? Don't they know if they don't, you know, it wasn't like a, 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 a critical prayer. But it was prayer for deep concern for their souls. Right. Come on. As a parent would pray for their sons and daughters who are struggling in life. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, parents? Yeah. Hmm? That was my prayer. Obviously, we are living in troubled times. But more so for the believer. Our nation has given themselves over to polluted ideals. You can say amen. Homosexuality, transgenderism, the love of money, violence, lawlessness. And to make matters worse, the church has become seeker friendly, become uh, a church of easy believism, organizations that have lowered its integrity and standards. Sermons are watered down as not to offend those attending. Now you must understand before you Throw a rock at me. <laughs> or some tomatoes, some oranges. Okay? I'm also looking in the mirror and examining my heart to see where I've erred concerning the condition of the church and also my soul. Because, you know, if you, you've been here for a while, you know what, what I'm about. Okay? I don't portray myself as some spiritual giant, someone that walks on water, uh, someone that, you know, is above anybody. Obviously, this is my position as a pastor to preach the word of God, and I have responsibilities, and I get all that, the authority and the office of that. But uh, before I throw stones, I, I pick up rocks out of my pocket. Amen. And I look in the mirror, have, have I erred? Have I compromised uh, when it comes to my preaching and uh, what you would have me tell your people? Uh, is this, am I involved in their falling away at times and their apathy and coldness of heart? Have I uh, compromised in, uh, myself and my ministry and even my soul as a, as a believer? Amen. So uh, like I said, I, I, like I always say, I preach from here, oh, from Manuel that way. I can't forget my <laughs> brother back there. Well, I go that way. Hello? So I asked the Lord, man, God, am I, uh, 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 do I have any part of this? I think we should. We should always, the Bible says, examine your heart to see whether you're in the faith, right? right? That we should, you know, when things are chaotic in your home, man, I'm talking to men only right now, the husbands and the fathers and the leaders of their home. When you find your home in a chaotic state, when you find, amen, that there's more fighting than loving, you know, you can point the finger at her because of her big mouth, because of your devilish kids, okay? But how many know we must start with us first? I do. Okay. And after I find out that it was all her fault. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't do that. Then we go from, then we go down. Get it? Then I started examining other things. But it begins with us, man. Yes, I preach in leadership. I preach in being the authority in your home. But also too, amen, our position in our homes, wives, yeah, the Bible says submit to your husband. Oh, here we go. I didn't curse right now. Okay. But also, too, we got another half that, you know, as Christ is over him, if, okay, the, the man is over the wife. So you got your part, man, also. 
that you must have Christ over you and total submission to him. And if not, uh, that's where the sparks fly. That's when their tongue keeps the wagon still. Hello? Okay. But when a man, amen, is taking care of his leadership and fulfilling his position in the home, then guess what happens? This begins to slow down, slowly but surely. And then when it does open up, you get accolades. You get, come on, you get a little love in it once in a while. You know, you get, you know, little surprises. Okay? I know what I'm doing good, but my wife makes me shrimp and rice. <laughs> when, I'm, when she makes me that, oh, it, and you know what? Because I can feel all the love. I don't need sex. Just give me some shrimp and rice. Oh my God! He said sex on a Sunday church service. Man, your kids know about sex than you do, homies. They can teach you a thing or two. <laughs> oh no! Don't say that. Anyway, let me get back to my message. There's a lot of responsibilities that you and I have in the kingdom of God. Yes, they're all around us and family and job and I get all that, but our responsibilities and our, pri and our priorities in the kingdom should be of utmost importance. Why? Because look around what's going on in our world. We have this, this virus still you know, lingering. We got this war. We got to look around the lawlessness. We got uh, the church, amen. And I'm not trying to hear it say that all churches are you know, compromised because there are many great churches that are preaching God's word unadulterated. They're preaching it raw. But for the most part, amen, the half are just not bringing the raw word that changes the hearts. Because hmm? if you tell me that I'm great and loving, I will take kindness for weakness and believe it. So I need to know that uh, I'm erring, that I am missing the mark at times through the preaching of the Word of God. You know, as, as a pastor and those involved in ministry, the Bible says in Colossians 1 28, says, Him we preach, talking about Christ, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's a heavy responsibility for a minister. That I must warn you, even though you don't care about the warnings, and don't, uh, ah, well, it ain't going to happen in my marriage, it's not going to happen with me. Oh, I have warned you, uh, kids to adults. I have preached to and taught the kids that, you know what, liven up, don't get involved in this, all right? Be careful, abstain, amen from immoralities or you're gonna get pregnant, you're gonna have a child too young, too soon, it's gonna hinder your life, and now you gotta go to school with a big old stomach. And not only that, more likely you're gonna be involved with a deadbeat dad or deadbeat father, amen, that he don't know what to do with the with the child. Just as much as you knew what to do. I warned them, I pleaded, abstain from immorality, fornication, and you know, you know what? And God will bless your life. He'll favor your life. And, and when it's time to have some children, you spit them out all day long. <laughs> I warn couples, uh, be careful of this and that. Be careful of social media now. Because it will come in and infiltrate your home. All of a sudden you get a request, a friend request from an old dog from back in the day. From an old hoochie too. <laughs> And it becomes, a, it begins to get a little exciting, doesn't it? I don't have social media at all. Okay, the only social media I got right now is YouTube, and I don't even need control of that. Okay, so it's all about Brandy's fault. Okay? <laughs> but I've been there when I get on my computer, on my laptop, and you know, I'm going through my emails, all of a sudden you get this little thing pop up. Ooh, women over 50 in your area. <laughs> and you know the woman they got in the picture, she's not 50, she's younger. But it's an enticement, it's a lure. Come on. But does anybody listen? I'm trying to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And I'm mean, saying man, that also refers to women, okay? But sometimes you, get, you gotta make my job difficult. Okay? Not you, the Thursday crew, the Thursday church. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who rule over you. Now I'm not gonna deal with that right now. And be submissive. That, that would be your part. For they watch out for your souls 
as those who must give an account. So I must give an account to God Almighty concerning your souls. And if I have erred or compromised in any manner, I will be the one dealt with by my God. Amen. Hello? So I must be very careful about that. Amen? And, and the Bible says, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Hello? So I take these responsibilities and the Word of God serious in my life. Come on. Now, you might be wondering what this story got to do with what I'm referring to, and, and I'll get to that right now. This morning, you might not be in that condition. In fact, you might be the epitome of godliness. Okay? <laughs> That's why I said, hey, I'm not even there. Okay, the epitome of godliness. And maybe you are. You know, there's, there's, there's actually good honest, saved, righteous people in church, okay? But if that's you, then you know what? Just kick back and go for the ride, okay? <laughs> but I may know, you know, whether you come to church periodically, faithfully, or here and there, uh, and you have an appearance of godliness. Well, how many of the Bible says that it talks about you can have an appearance of godliness, but deny the power of, the, thereof. Hello? So how do we know, and this and we'll go from preaching that way to this way, there'll be times that we have a form of godliness, even as faithful members, and really we're not being too godly at times. Amen. Amen. Hmm? What is the condition of your heart today? Where are you at, honestly and seriously with God? You must ask yourself that. And I feel, amen, that believers... And the sinner must get back, get back to the altar. Amen. What do I mean by the altar? Well, I'll get that. We need to be honest with God this morning, if not every day. Yes. We need to get back in worship. Yes. Why are, why is it so difficult for people to literally worship God during the song service? I'll tell you why. Because it stems from your relationship with Him. Amen. Okay. Okay, I, I can fake the funk and raise my hands all day long, okay, and act like I'm worshiping, but God knows the truth. He sees the heart, okay? But worship of God is the result of our love for Him, okay? Uh, I, I love my wife, okay, and I'm able to serve her and fulfill my duties as a husband because of love and because of a relationship. Not all the time. Don't get me wrong. There are times when I don't get shrimp and rice. There are times when I get a dean. You know what a dean is? Honey, the food's in the microwave. You know a dean, right? Okay. Uh, so I know when, you know, okay, that happened, all right, well, I must have missed the mark somewhere. Or she's been whatever. Okay? So we need to get back to worship. What, why can't we lift our hands to God? Honestly? If you love Jesus and believe in Him, why can't you worship and sing to Him? Are you embarrassed? Are you ashamed? Huh? But we will hoot and holler during a, a football game, a baseball, basketball. We will hoot and holler, amen, when we gather with family, amen, when you hear your favorite song, you're dropping it like it's not. <laughs> Stay away from that. You ain't not. You ain't got it no more. <laughs> huh? We make all kinds of noise on our favorite show. I mean, people, but why in the house of God? You got to get back to worship. You know, when I first got saved, and I, 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 I didn't have no religious background, and I, and, I, and I came to church in the men's home and rehab, and I'm there, and I looked around, and all the people were seen, and they were lifting their hands, like, what the heck going on here, man? <laughs> huh? And they were intent in worshiping, they were, they were serious, uh, people, I would see tears as they're worshiping God, I'm like, what's going on here? I did not understand. But as I continued, God got to hold my heart, then I understood. When I started building my relationship with him and realized, man, I, I have a loving God that has saved me and delivered me from heroin addiction. And, for and I had been on drugs for so many years and he was the only one that could do it. You know, I realized why they would worship. We need to get back to worship. Amen. We need to get back to kingdom business. Come on. We're taking so much time in other places in our lives 
when we are not being involved in kingdom business. What is kingdom business? Evangelism. Go on. Preaching the gospel to your family, your friends. Involvement in the house of God, whether it's nursery, teaching, ushering, song. There's some all right, part you can play in the kingdom of God. Well, you know, I've got time, Pastor. You're lucky I came to church this morning. Huh? <laughs> we need to get back to kingdom business. We need to get back to discipleship. Yes. Hmm? Discipleship. Humbling yourself under a teaching of Christ, first and foremost, and allowing a man, a, a man to teach you and to train you in the ways of God. Now, you, now, don't get me wrong, I'm not here standing up here saying, oh, you know what, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ, like Paul could say. But I can tell you how to stay married for 29 years. And it ain't been easy, at times it ain't fun, but I can tell you how, and I can teach you how to stay married for 29 years. I can show you how to stay clean for 29 years. Hmm? Not one fix of heroin, not one puff of crack, not one line of cocaine, not one puff of a joint, a cigarette, or not even a drop of liquor. Except one time, someone gave me a candy. Okay, and I didn't know that they made Bacardi candy. Did you guys know that? Okay, and in fact, there was an off star, and they gave it to my pastor. He goes, Hey, get one of these. Wow, look, whew, it's kind of strong, Pastor Dan. <laughs> we, we eat it. No, we look, we look on the wrapper. Oh, Lord, 151 drops. <laughs> I spit that thing out, and, but, but then again, like, Lord. <laughs> Get behind me, devil. <laughs> All right. I can, I can teach you that. That's what I've been for 29 years. I've been sober and clean. Huh? Uh, 28 years, 29 years of ministry. So there might be something you can learn. We need to get back to reaching the loss at any cost. You see that banner? It's not there just for looks, it's to catch your attention. We believe in that. My wife and I believe in that when we left our jobs 28 years ago, good paying jobs, living three blocks from the beach where people spend thousands of dollars yearly to go. We just live right there. I can smell the salt air from my, from my place. I can hear the dolphins in the waves. <laughs> we live right there. Huh? Good praying job, great paying jobs. Hmm? Okay. But we had to reach some loss. That was our calling and purpose. And after nine years, we left the beach for the desert of Tulare. Now, no glory to me and her, but the point being, amen, this is what we were called to, reaching the laws. If that means leaving a city, leaving our homes, so be it. But for some, we won't even, you know, come to an outreach. Maybe give to missions, maybe preach it to your neighbors. Come on. Do your neighbors even know you're saved? They might know you're not saved because of all that yelling, all that hooper and hollering going on. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. We need to get back to the altar. That's the title of my message. Back to the altar. So let me get to this, my text quickly. So here in our text, we have the prophet Elijah. He had been preaching wrath, upcoming judgment upon these people if they don't change. Uh, in fact, God used them to prophesy famine and drought because of their disobedience, because of their worship of idols. And he's just basically been just causing a muck in that nation. And King Ahab was fed up with him. In fact, you read it, Chapter 18, verse 17, uh, when uh, Elijah finally came to him and said, Oh, is that you, Elijah? Oh, troubler of Israel? Yeah. He called him a troublemaker. All you do, amen, you ruin everything. 
We're here trying to worship our idols, amen. We're here trying to live immoral and lie and just, and just give into our flesh. But here you come with the word of God. Here you do is come bring judgment. All right. You, you, everything we do is wrong. Everything we do is unholy. So he will, if, if King Ahab, like, you're a troublemaker, man. Well, I don't want nothing to do with you. Elijah was given the task of restoring God's standards okay, back to him. Okay. You have to realize when you get serious about God and you give 100% and you're sold out, people will view you as a troublemaker. Yeah. You know, I've seen that in my own home and, don't get, and, and must understand. Well, as a parent, when you begin to lay the law down and you begin to have rules. You will not listen to this ungodly, this defiled music in the house. It is uh, vexing my spirit, youngster. Come on. Yeah. You will not be late at night. You will not stay out late at night. You have a curfew. This is what must be done. You cannot, you know, uh, do this or that. You got, you cannot be with these people. When you start doing that in your home, oh, you're gonna cause trouble. That's right. That's right. And, I, and I did that. I, I, and you know, I, I didn't do it right. I was very, very legalistic when I first got saved and trying to. And I was a step parent, and I, I see where I've erred, and I, I didn't have you know, the, the grace that I needed. But I was learning, right? But trouble, you'll be a troublemaker in your home when you begin to set godly standards. And then, you know, you, you, as a husband, you're trying to do that, then you got her. Well, then, come on, you gotta have a little bit more grace. And, you know, Miho, you know, Miha, you know, they don't understand. Oh, no, they understand plenty. Come on, they do. Mm hmm. Not my baby, your baby's 48 already. <laughs> I think it's time to discipline the dude, man. Good old baby Huey. Huh? What's gonna happen? He's gonna expect that from, from a girl, a woman that, and he ain't gonna get a mama. Not unless you, like, you wanna be a mama, unless you, well that's what cougars are, cougars are for. <laughs> if you wanna be a cougar, that's fine, okay, yes. But you're stuck with him. He's not living in the real world. Because I'm a young man that when we go out there and we find the love of our lives, they're not like mama. They got opinions. Have you said, man, have you learned that? Have you seen that? They talk. And they give you opinions. They want to be equal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They want your money too. Without giving theirs up. Yeah, 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 my wife said, amen, hallelujah, praise God. <laughs> oh, don't get me started, man, don't get me started. Okay. <laughs> no, I gotta go home with her, so I ain't starting up. Mama didn't raise no fool. <laughs> we got to get back to the altar. And I'm not here throwing, throwing stone because I know where I lack and fail. But we, and I say we, I'm talking about the church in general. We need to get back to the altar, okay? But what happens, most people are satisfied to live around the altar. When I talk about the altar, am I referring to a literal altar? Here in the text, Elijah said, he, he said he brought everybody near the altar because they had been far away from it. They had gotten involved into heathen worship, idol worship, they were far from God's altar. So they said, you know what? We're going to do something right here. I need to get these people back to the altar. And we are going to give a sacrifice to God Almighty. So he tells the false prophets, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have two altars. You get your bowl, you cut it up into pieces. I'll get my bowl, we'll cut it up to pieces. You worship your God, your idol, you false prophets. And I will call upon my God, the true God. Let's see which offering is consumed. So if you read that whole chapter, I didn't have time to. What's going on is the false prophets began to pray. and They began to sing unto their heathen idols. But nothing happened. 
In fact, Elijah began to talk smack. He said, oh, because what happened, they, they, nothing was happening to their, to their bowl. It wasn't being consumed. So what happened, Elijah go, well, maybe he's asleep. Maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he's busy doing something else and he can't hear you. Because they began to cut themselves. Read that chapter. They, they, that was their normal pattern in their worship. They would cut themselves and bleed all over the altar so their God or their heathen God would move, right? But they cut themselves and nothing. Elijah was talking smack. He's like, yeah, he's pounding that. Oh, what happened? Is he asleep now all of a sudden? So nothing. And this is where we take the reading where he says, okay, Okay, Israel, come back to the altar here. Look to see what God's going to do right now. In fact, he goes, get some water, fill it up, and we're going to put water all over this altar. We're going to put seed. We're going to build a trench around it. We're going to make a little canal around it. In fact, we're going to do it three times. We're going to fill this thing. It's going to be like a little lake. And this is when he prays, oh, my God, oh, Lord. And the Bible says that the fire consumed everything. It consumed the bulls, the water, the dust, the rocks. Hello. Come on. Lord, hey, come on. This is where we need to be. We need to come back to the altar where there are miracles, where there's transformation, where there's change. Come on, because come on, look around, man. We I'm talking about in general. Where's the change? Where's the deliverance from drugs? Depression, family being reunited, and relationship restored. Where is that? Hmm? Yeah. Thank you. You know the altar. When you live, when you've chosen to live at the altar, okay, this is for true transformation happens. When I first got saved, and I was in the men's home. I was there about thirty days. No, no, excuse me. Uh, yeah, no, nah, maybe two weeks. And there was a disciple, you know, he, he did a Bible study. He was being trained in ministry. And, and he preached this scripture, or he taught on it, Romans 12, 1. You know that one? I beseech you, you I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living yes. sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable duty. He taught on that. And it really, they kind of messed with me in my heart. I'm like, man, God, you want me to sacrifice my body? Which you, when you say body, then it wasn't a literal body, but me, my soul, yes. my will, my intentions. So he, he taught on that. And when I got back to the men's home the following day, when we prayed in the mornings, it was just gnawing at me. So I'm there. Uh, and we're praying, I'm there in the men's home praying, like we did. And I said, okay, I didn't know how to pray. Cause I wasn't, like I said, I never got there. And, and so I wasn't really religious at all. So I said, God, I present my body right now. I had the Bible open so I could read it, the scripture. I present my body right now as a living sacrifice. I'm going to, uh, my purpose is to become holy, to, be alive in you, and I surrender my whole being to you right now. Whether you give me anything back, all right, I just want to be delivered from drugs. I don't care if I don't, you don't give me a car, give me a woman, give me a house. I just want deliverance from drug addiction. I surrender to you, and my body, after that, look, you, I'm yours. And at that moment, I began to shake, I began to cry, and I got filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. I didn't know. And I'm like, I talked to him, but my neighbor was praying, my, one of the brothers, they go, they go, what, what happened? Oh, you got filled with the Holy Spirit? I go, wow. And I started speaking in tongues. It started, it sounded kind of weird at first, because when you first speak in tongues, you gotta, you gotta exercise it, okay? And it sounded like, a man, am I tripping on it? Is it the withdrawal? What's really going on here? <laughs> Huh? God received sacrifice because I came to him in, with a sincere and genuine spirit. Amen. And that experience, that, that scripture, one scripture changed my life to this day. This is why I've been able to maintain this. Now, don't get me wrong. It, it is a, that was it. The Bible says to work out your salvation, your own salvation with fear and trembling, right? Yes. 
is you and you alone and God. You can't work out both. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know why it's husband. You know, have you learned that you cannot work out your both both of you together? It's got to be an individual working out of your salvation. Mm -hmm. So Elijah, he called the nation back to the altar. We need to rebuild the altar, Amen. and I am just as guilty as you. Because there are times when you get discouraged when people they turn their backs on God and it makes you like you know what's the point you know you've been preaching I've been laboring I've been counseling and I give my life oh God to this and only for them to turn their backs on you you get you know you start having this pity party come on let's, let's be real and what's the point man work with another disciple oh, man I can burn, the last one burned me okay. Uh, there's no more room in my back for knives. In fact, this guy got to use a pick. <laughs> Get it? Yeah. There's no room back there. That's it, God. But then God reminds me, hey, the church is mine, not yours, buddy. You're just a servant. Huh? You just do what I tell you to do. Don't worry, I'll heal your back. <laughs> yeah. We need to rebuild the altar. Because it has been destroyed by apathy, worldliness, prayerlessness, and simply neglect. Yeah. Come on. If, you, if you've been a Christian and aren't Christian, all you got to do is neglect your salvation for about a week. Don't pray for about a week or two. And you'll be the most carnal. <laughs> you'll be irritable. Right. You'll be in the flesh. You know, you, you, you get home from work. How you doing, babe? Oh, shut the hell up, man. I don't even want to talk to you. Oh my God, he said hell in church. <laughs> no, that's just your, that's just your home. That ain't nothing. She said something else. She, she, she is a $64,000 bomb. You know which one? Huh? Why is that? Neglect. You neglect your salvation. You neglect your devotion, your spirituality. You're going to act like a heathen. You will be intolerant. And I don't know about you, if you're married, you got to have a lot of tolerance. you got to have years of tolerance. Right? Because you will not always hit a home run. And she will not always cook the perfect meal. Okay? The altar. It is the meeting place with God. Okay? The altar is where you bring your Isaacs to God. This is for parents. You have unsaved sons and daughters. They're not going to change themselves. They need to be brought to the altar of God. I believe my life has changed because my family, my sister, brought me to the altar of God. They sacrificed me at the altar. Like, remember, Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, literally. And God spared him at that moment. And he was testing Abraham's heart to see if he would bring Isaac to the altar and trust God. And Abraham passed the test. And God had told him to literally sacrifice him and with the knife, remember? But God stopped him and he provided another sacrifice, the sheep in the bush, and they also and they all sacrificed that instead of Isaac. But this is where we bring our Isaacs. Huh? If your son or daughter or family member is not saved, you need to bring them to the altar. Well, God knows my need. The Bible says that he already knows what I need, he needs if I don't ask him. No, I'm not talking about I'm talking about bringing Okay, your son or daughter to the altar, literally, and place them right here. Not literally, but spiritually and emotionally. This is, the altar is a place of sacrifice. This is where you die. How many know you need your flesh to die? Daily, if not weekly. Huh? When you come to the altar, you say, Lord, man, I've had a rough week. You know what? Man, I... I said some stuff. I, I I kind of cursed a little bit. You know what? I, I you know what? I I hated my wife. I hated my cousin. I hated my kids. I even you know was mad at you, God. And this is where you deny yourself. This is where you humble yourself and you're honest with God. This is where transformation happens. This is where you die to self. Am I saying that? Oh, I want everybody to rush this altar this day. Not talking about the altar at your home, in your prayer closet, in your car. Come on, we take a walk. See, when, you, when you get alone with God, but we're not doing that. The altar is a place of consecration. This is where we get our, our purpose and calling. This is how I found, prayed and asked God to show me, Lord, what is your calling? 
Is it ministry? Is it pioneering church? This is where he spoke to me. I brought that. And this is where I was consecrated at the altar. In our text, it says that Elijah, he brought 12 stones, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel, right? And the, the number 12 represents God's divine government. What happened is they were running lawless. They were everybody was just doing their own thing. They were just worshiping the God of this, the God of that, that idol. They were all they were all in disarray and divided. And God said, "Oh no, I, you know what? I'm gonna give you twelve stones that represents the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay, and this is gonna signify order. Let me know. We need order. Left to ourselves, we ruin a good thing. Left to myself, I will be back." On heroin, I will sell everything I got. I will ruin and divide my marriage. I will be, and can you imagine the backlash when it comes to those that have preached to, and I become a castaway myself. The mocking, the mockery, and uh, I knew it. I knew Eddie get back. I knew he'd go back to drugs. I he was just bumping his gums all those years. People would mock. Okay, the church would be affected. Right? Oh Lord, I need the altar just to just to make it to today. Mm, come on. Right? We need order. We need divine order from God. Huh? That's why Elijah put those 12 stones to show them. He knew that if he could bring Israel back to the altar and the altar back to Israel, that he would bring them back to God. Hmm? Am I saying that you are far from God this morning? That No, I'm not saying you don't have a real relationship with him. I, I'm not saying that. Because obviously you come to church because you desire God in your life. Yeah. You're here, for like I said the other day, unless you're a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, you're honestly here because of God, right? And if you're a wolf, hey amen, I, I, I got you and I got a 22 AK aimed at you. All right? <laughs> you can't get nothing wrong. You can't get away with nothing here. <laughs> but then again, it, then one slide, right? Mm -hmm. But this is where America's at right now. They need to get back to the altar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the greatest structure we can build in America is not a torn down statue or rebuild a, a building, skyscraper, but we need to rebuild the altar in our city, in our church, and in our home. Problem is, pride. Oh, we got some pride, don't we? And the most humble person you would think usually has the most pride. Look at her, she's so holy. She's just so, oh my God. She's just like, she's pure as a driven snow. Well, let me ask her husband. Yeah, well, uh -huh. don't talk too loud right now. Oh, humility. We need old-fashioned, outdated place called the altar. Come on. Second Chronicles 714. I've heard this scripture all throughout the pandemic. I, on TV, by preachers, on YouTube. Second Chronicles 714. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Okay. I have been hearing the scripture, like I said, repeated since all this drama from the pandemic and from what's going on in our world and in our nation. Okay. But the question is today, has anyone humbled themselves and actually huh, apply this to their lives? Because how many know that he says in that scripture that he will forgive us of our sin and he will heal our, the land. How many need healing in their marriage? Come on. Does your marriage need healing? Does your family need healing? Does your finances need healing? Your mind need healing? Well, maybe if you would humble yourself, ask God to forgive you of sin, then you will get your healing. Wow, but that takes humility. That takes admittance. Come on. That means I got to not be in denial 
and come to the altar and say, Lord, you know what, man, I can just, yeah, you know, I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm guilty. I've been just messing around. I, you know, I love you. I, I, I believe in you, but I'm not applying the scriptures like I need to. I got my own stinking thinking and I'm like your word says, you know, I'm right in my own eyes. Huh? I lean on my understanding all the time. I justify my sin. Come on. Yeah. And, and you know, I am, I am a hypocrite at times. You know what the word hypocrite means? It means being an actor. Yeah. And I was one of the greatest actors when I was a heroin addict. Oh, I can act. Oh my God. I mean, I would burn people just simply by acting. I would make you feel sorry for me and you would give me the shirt off your back and then I'd sell it back to you. <laughs> huh, my sister. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I was good at lying and acting. And acting, my character was okay when I had all kinds of deep, ugly, wicked, evil issues in this heart of mine. Come on. Yeah. Are we making altars? Are we building altars? You know, and that's another thing, and I try to wind this down here, is that, you know, the Bible talks about the altar in Exodus on how one should not really build an altar, but how the description of an altar should be. Exodus 20, verse 25 says, And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of whom or whom stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. What is... What is Moses saying here that profane means unholy. He's saying, look it, I don't need an altar of your building of your own understanding. Because when you start doing your thing on it and you bring it in a certain way, if it's not according to my standards, all right, you will have profaned it. I don't want you to lay one finger on it. Do not touch it. He says, leave it alone. You're going to make me an altar? Let it be. Don't come in with your own perception, your own opinion about holiness and righteousness and standards. Okay, let it be totally on the reliance of these holy scriptures. Come on, yeah. God doesn't want just fragments of our lives. Have you noticed that? He don't want seconds. You know, He don't want. You know, I was gonna say something else, but forgive me. I just never thought of that one. But anyway, you know, men don't know what I'm talking about. He doesn't want seconds. Okay. You don't want parts and pieces. Yes, you're here this morning. Thank God that you're here. Amen. But he wants you every day. Well, you don't have church every day. Well, I would probably die of stuff, exhausted. He wants you to live a life that is holy, acceptable, and pleasing to you. Because the Bible says in Romans 12, 1, it is your reasonable duty. Well, how about my mom, my job, and my work, and my family? You can do it all at once. God can only, God is involved in all those areas. You can serve God at work. You don't have to get involved with all that talk and all that, you know, illicit and ungodly behavior. You can separate yourself, but not to the point where you're so righteous. Oh, look, at, here comes a nun. They used to call me, oh, here comes Pastor Ed, even before I was a pastor, at my job. All right. And, and, but I was, I was still talking to them. Okay. I was still, you know, you know, but when it came to conversations, amen, and I would, uh, I was slowly kind of just, you know, uh, it's not easy being a believer in a wicked area. <laughs> Come on. Remember this? When I was at my job as a maintenance man? And maintenance men, they're the worst. They're the most evil and wicked, most fleshly people at job, maintenance men. So be careful of maintenance men. <laughs> Then my wife says, yeah. <laughs> but they were evil. They, you know, they talk about all the secretaries. They talk about all the women and all of them. And then I, said, I would go into a story. It my, I call it my sanctuary, my, my holy of holies, right? But my boss, the one that was training me, he had all these pictures of nudes in the store and the tool shed. And this, you know, they were all there. And I go, well, kind of hard to pray. Like, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, you know what I mean? <laughs> It bothered me. I had nowhere to go. You remember? That? So I did. I got paper and I cut out little dresses and little pants. I did. So what I did, I got back to work and I put glue on it. I went like, I'm hoping I landed in the right spot. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> it was a tough job, but somebody had to do it. <laughs> Man, my wife ain't helping me at all this morning. 
you should go back and do something. Uh, but I had to do that. So when my boss walked in later on, he looked at it. I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know if he laughed. I don't know if he felt convicted. But he took them all down. He threw them away. And, you know, for the most part, someone just dealt with it, whatever. But I didn't want to look at that. No, the flesh wanted to look at it. But the Jesus in me is like, oh, Lord, this is going to be a long struggle. I'm going to be here for a minute. I worked in that company nine years. This was the first year. But I made that stance. And he didn't take it as, oh, I was being self-righteous and oh, so critical. But he kind of got it. It was like, a, he, he got it. Get it? Yeah. You got to get back to the altar. And it's going to take an investment. Let me know there's nothing free in this world. Yes, yeah, salvation, the free gift of salvation. But how many know that it costs you something? Here, amen. And my last point is that they were in a famine. You must understand that. There was no water. There was very scarce. So when Elijah said, go give me 12 or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the pots of water. Okay. It, it, you know, it was scarce. Somebody had to give it up. Like, hey, give me, hey, give me your water. Try it, man. This is my family. Yeah. Yeah. Those four, the four pots of water. And he said, do it three times. That was a total of 12. Okay. And then they put seed, which was valuable because there was a famine, there was drought. He said, bring, bring all this seed, put it at the altar, get the water. So it costs something. To get back to the altar is going to cost something. Your time, your finances, come on. The giving of yourself. The flesh and its activities, which appeases us at times. But you must understand that the Bible is true when it says sin, there's pleasure in sin. It is fun. It feels good. I don't care if you are 16 or 68. Okay, at 68, you might not be able to do much, but it still feels good. It's still there, the desire, come on, be real. But the Bible says there's pleasure in sin, but it only lasts for a season. And like I'm always telling people, you know what? It's time to hang it up when it's not fun no more. Getting high and getting drunk, going to clubs, doing, being with women, being with men, doing all these things that we do. It was fun, and we got notches on our belt and on our bedposts, and oh, I drank, you know, 38 beers, and I didn't even go to die. Man, I didn't, I didn't even fall down. Uh, uh, eventually, it ends. For me, it ended at the age of 27 when I found myself on the streets. Broke, gutter hype, lost my kids, lost my girl, lost family, that was the season ending for me at 27. You know what? I don't know what, what, when your season will end, but you know what? I had to wait. I almost lost my life. Okay. And thank God that he came and screwed me up right in time. It's going to take an investment. If you really want something, you'll spend time in pursuing it. Come on. Remember when you met your girl, you met your guy? Oh my God, you pursued her him. You, you snuck in her window. You opened the window for him. You talked hours on the phone. Well, nobody, nobody talks anymore, but whatever you guys do now, you youngsters do now. Huh? Hours on the phone. We were, we were pursuing somebody. Maybe we wanted, we wanted to save money for a house, a car, a job. I mean, we were pursued, but we wanted that. Come on. How much do you, you want? The things of God this morning. Are you willing to pursue it? Hmm? See, it's going to take work. It's going to take an investment of that which God has given you and bless you with. Hmm? But what's going to take most importantly is coming back to the altar. Hmm? Back to the altar and being honest with God. Okay. Because he, amen, is ready to use you. Like he's always been waiting for you. And let me tell you something. This world's not getting any better. It's going to get more difficult and more difficult as the days go by. Pretty soon, amen, you're going to be paying $20 a gallon. You, you, 
do you do this? You go to the gas station, you're like, oh, God. And we all tell everybody, man, you know how much it took me to fill up my truck? My car it was the same car. Like, you know how much I just put? Everybody, I went to the gas station last night. And I was like, hey, can you put gas in my car? Oh, God. <laughs> but I got a very equal vibe. She's like, here, you can use my car. And usually I'll take care of it. But I said, you know what? Time to roll, babe. Give me pasta. <laughs> You know what I mean? This is your car. You drive it. I've never in it, so you know what. But you feel pretty good, and I, you know, because you got all money, and I pay the bills and all that. But I, that's not like you know what. I'm gonna find a little low, babe. Give me your car, okay? But she offered. I took it. But anyways, and I look at all, all these guys are putting gas, and they all have the same look. Like, oh, God. They're like, hey, can I continue? But the gas. The violence, the lawlessness, the, oh my God, the division in our homes, our youth, our young adults are being made astray, man. And that's why I think when you get young adults in the place, man, I'm so thankful, man, that they're at least here, they're listening, and maybe something will get across because I hate for them to spend their lives in regret. Uh, the, the Holy Ghost will speak to them. They will feel the love of God. They will experience God for their lives and, 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 and examine their hearts. And, to study the scriptures and see what I'm saying is right. Amen? But we need to come back to the altar. Let's bow our heads this afternoon.